Hi everyone, my name is Sergei Nikomarov. I am a senior system developer at Acumatica platform department. And today I want to talk with you about Acuminator, Visual Studio and other developer tools that can boost your productivity and validate your solution quality. Here is the agenda. We will start with Acuminator and cover the changes in the latest release. Then we will switch to Visual Studio. Covering its different parts will take most of this session. We will discuss how you can write code efficiently in Visual Studio. Then we will investigate code analysis settings and Visual Studio integration with other tools. After that, we will look at some of Visual Studio alternatives. And at the end, I will list useful Visual Studio plugins so that can simplify your daily routine. So let's begin with Accuminator. Accuminator 3.0.0 has been released in April. Here is an overview of its new features. The main feature is the support of Visual Studio 2022. In addition to two previous versions of Visual Studio 2017 and 2019, there are some enhancements in code analysis. CodeMap now displays more information and there are bug fixes and minor improvements in the error suppression mechanism. Let's look closer at the changes in static code analysis. We relaxed code analysis a bit after realizing that some of accumulated diagnostics are too strict. For example, the rule that forbids throwing exceptions in the row persisted graph event became more flexible. Now it does not report an error if the graph is a processing graph. It also does not report if the exception type belongs to several allowed exception types or is derived from them. So we allow to throw in the row persisted event handler two special acumatic exception types, PX row persisted exception and PX log violation exception. And we also allow three common .NET exception types, not implemented exception, not supported exception and argument exception, and also exception types derived from them. Underscores are now allowed in deck extension names. You still can't use them for names of decks and deck fields. We significantly extended the PX1008 diagnostic that checks long run delegates for captured graph references. Turns out these changes made the PX1088 diagnostic redundant. Therefore, we removed it. And now let's look at the changes in the PX1008 diagnostic because now it can find a serious error in your code. There is a common mistake that frequently appears in the code that starts a long run operation. Sometimes the delegate passed to the start operation method accidentally captures the reference to the screen graph. Usually it is captured with a call to some instance method. A call to an instance method requires a reference to the graph instance. Therefore, it is captured in the delegate closure. You can see an example on the slide here. Capturing reference to the screen graph will cause different tricky issues, including synchronous delegate execution and data consistency problems. There are different ways to fix the incorrect code, as you can see on the slide. Uh, one of them is to create a separate graph instance inside the long run delegate and use it to call the instance method. As you can see, it can be hard to spot captured graph references. At the same time, Accuminate already had the PX1008 diagnostic that checked processing delegates for the same thing. We enhanced this diagnostic and now, as you can see on the slide, it also checks a long run delegates. So now let's switch to the enhancements in code map tool window. On this slide, you can see that code map now has different icons for DEX, uh, DEX extensions graphs and graph extensions. There is also a new indicator that shows if the node represents DEC or DEC extension. These changes should allow you to immediately distinguish graphs and DECs from their extensions. CodeMap tool window layout is now remembered by Visual Studio. Now its behavior is closed to Solution Explorer window and you don't need to constantly reopen it. For graphs and graph extensions, CodeMap now displays nodes that represent overrides of virtual type members from base types. They are grouped together under the new base overrides node. Since persist method overrides are rather special for Acumatica, they are indicated with a special diskette icon. 
The slide provides an example of base overrides for the sales order screen graph. Code map now displays nodes that represent information and initialization uh, information about initialization and activation. Such nodes are grouped under the new initialization and activation category node. You can see an example on the slide. For graphs and graph extensions, there will be nodes representing instance and static constructors. For graph extensions and deck extensions, there will be nodes representing is active methods. This is all about Accuminator, and now let's move on to Visual Studio. Visual Studio replaces a dozen of separate developer tools for us. It covers many different areas of software development. It is the everyday tool for many developers. Visual Studio is huge. Among many different developer tools, Visual Studio stands out like an ocean liner among smaller boards. Therefore, we decided to make a session that will cover some of its areas. This session refers to Visual Studio 2022, which is the latest released version. Some of the described features could be unavailable for previous versions of Visual Studio. Let's talk about Visual Studio features. First of all, it is a convenient code editor that helps us to read code with the syntax highlighting and code regions folding, write code with a smart code completion, insert prepared code snippets, use multiple carrots to edit similar pieces of code, and perform quick actions with keyboard shortcuts. Visual Studio finds errors in your code while you type it with code analysis diagnostics, and this includes even custom diagnostics that you can write yourself. You can also debug your code step by step, even in a complex environment. Visual Studio integrates with external tools like a Git version control system. Visual Studio is highly configurable and extendable. There are tons of settings that allow you to customize Visual Studio to your liking. For example, you could configure your own custom colors for all code parts. You can configure folding of different code blocks, hide parts of the code editor from the user interface, and display horizontal line separators between methods. You can enable word wrap functionality to wrap long lines of code that do not fit the screen. You can customize your scroll bar so it would contain file overview, and that's just a small part of what you can change in code editor appearance. Unfortunately, due to the limited time, we have to cut down the session and exclude descriptions of some of these settings, but we will try to describe them in another webinar. Finally, there are numerous extensions for Visual Studio. Some of them, like the well-known ReSharpen, extend its general functionality even further. Other plugins make Visual Studio more focused on your needs. For, for instance, Accuminator simplifies the development for Acumatica. And this is just a subset of different Visual Studio features. There are things like C Sharp Interpreter that allows you to write and immediately evaluate simple code, navigation to decompile sources, code quality metrics calculation, and many more things. In this session, we will look at some of these features to see how you can write code more efficiently in Visual Studio. Visual Studio provides us with a lot of different helpers that should boost our code writing skills. Today we are going to discuss some of these things like code completion, Visual Studio machine learning features, code snippets, and multiple carrots. I would like to show you some useful keyboard shortcuts and a couple of other interesting things, but the first thing I'm going to mention is Visual Studio options. Visual Studio Options is the place where you can find almost all Visual Studio settings. I would like to quickly show to you how you can open them. So, for this session, I prepared a small demo solution. And to access Visual Studio Options, you need to open top level tools uh, menu, find options, and here they are. You can see that there is a lot of settings. We don't have enough time to cover all of them, but during the session, I will explain some of these settings. Now let's move to our, to our first feature, the IntelliSense code completion. Nowadays, code elements have rather long names to better describe their design purpose. However, typing all these long names by hand can be tiresome. Fortunately, Visual Studio has advanced code completion functionality called IntelliSense. I'm sure most of you have used it. 
It is the list of possible variants you receive while typing the code. You can pick one of the variants from the list to immediately complete the code. The example is on the slide. Suggestions may include the types, local variables, type members, extension methods, and code snippets. The list of variants depends on the context, and by context I mean the programming language you use, framework used by the project, type of the document, current carried location in code, maybe something else. IntelliSense greatly helps you with the Kimetica framework because the framework consists of normal c -sharp types. It works with it like with any c -sharp code and will show you available framework APIs. For example, you can see a list of deck fields for a deck. It is also very useful when you write BQL queries. You can see available BQL operators. Like other Visual Studio features, IntelliSense can be configured. For c -sharp, you can find its settings in Visual Studio options in Text Editor c -sharp General and Text Editor c -sharp IntelliSense sections. I won't cover them in this session, but I encourage you to investigate them on your own. And as you pro uh, now Visual Studio machine learning features, as you probably know, for four years ago, Microsoft acquired GitHub. Couple of months after the acquisition announcement, Microsoft released IntelliCode experimental extension for Visual Studio 2019. According to Microsoft, IntelliCode uses a predictive model trained on around half a million public open source repositories from GitHub. It also trains its models on your solution in order to give you context-specific suggestions. The extension was a success. The new, in new Visual Studio 2022, it became a part of the main product and was extended even further. IntelliCode context-specific suggestions are useful for large code bases. However, you must train IntelliCode model on your solution in order to use them. Usually, Visual Studio will suggest you training IntelliCode on your code, but you can always access training functionality manually. So, let's do this. You need to open the top-level view menu. Here, find other Windows section, and then IntelliCode. You need to be assigned into Microsoft account in Visual Studio and give you agreement for training the model on your code. Some data about your code may be sent to Microsoft data centers. If you are concerned about privacy of your code, you can read Microsoft privacy statement for IntelliCode and then press learn patterns to start training. So that's basically everything to train the model. Train model can be shared with the team. You can also integrate retraining of IntelliCode model into continuous integration pipeline. And now let's see what features IntelliCode has. First feature is AI-assisted IntelliSense. It is the IntelliSense code completion extension that predicts the most likely correct API for the developer to use instead of just an alphabetical list of members. So let's take a look. Here, IntelliCode uses the developer's current code context to provide a dynamic list of suggestions. So when I type dot character, Visual Studio displays IntelliSense code completion list. And as you can see, the first five suggestions have a small star on the left side, which is a sign that they are provided by IntelliCode. This functionality works for different languages, but for c -sharp, IntelliCode also provides two extra IntelliSense features. The first one is argument completion. This capability starts uh, uh, the most likely argument names that you will use when you call a method and places those suggestions at the top of the completion list. So here I have equals method and you can see the first five suggestions are provided by IntelliCode. They have a star on the left, and there are some local variables and class fields. The second feature is context-specific suggestions. IntelliCode uses model trained on your code to more accurately predict API that are most likely to be used. We discussed it on the previous slide. Next feature is automatically generated refactoring suggestions. IntelliCode assists you when you make similar edits in several places. Suggestions appear in a light bulb menu in Visual Studio Editor, just like Accuminator code fixes. And 
Another feature is whole line completions. This is a new feature that appeared in Visual Studio 2022. It predicts the next chunk of your code based on your current code so far and presents it as a great text in line prediction. So here, let me select voided suggestion. And here you can see a gray line text uh, prediction, gray, gray text inline prediction here. And if you press tab, you can accept it or you can press escape or delete key to dismiss it. It works better if you trained into the code model on your code. And you can also change the accept button from tab to right arrow in IntelliCode settings in Visual Studio options. And here is another example. I will add a check for null for text run variable at the beginning of the method. So when I type if statement, IntelliCode suggests me the check and I accept it. And then when I uh, press enter, IntelliCode suggests me the next line. There are also three extra settings that control the behavior of completions. You can access them by pressing light bulb at the bottom left corner of the editor here. The first one, show completions for lines of code, allows you to disable the feature. The second, wait for pauses in typing before showing line completions when enabled will make predictions show up only if the user has paused typing. You may prefer this mode if you find the whole line completions distracting. And the last one, show completions on new lines. If enabled, will display predictions when you enter a new line. And finally, for C -sharp code bases, for C -sharp code bases, IntelliCode can do a clever generation of the editor config file. It will infer the code style and formatting from your solution. For some reason, it doesn't work in the latest update of my Visual Studio 2022. Therefore, I will demonstrate it in Visual Studio 2019. So here, you need to open Solution Explorer and then open Context Menu for a project or for a solution. And here you can see the command to create new editor config and the telecode will actually analyze your solution and infer code style for it. Uh, like many other Visual Studio uh, components, IntelliCode has its own settings in Visual Studio options. There is a separate section called IntelliCode for them. Now let's look at keyboard shortcuts and some tips on how you can use them. Keyboard shortcuts is a well-known feature that allows you to quickly perform some action by pressing a combination of keys on a keyboard. I'm sure everyone knows some shortcuts like copy with Ctrl plus C and paste with Ctrl plus V, cancel with Ctrl plus Z, search with Ctrl plus F and replace with Ctrl plus H. Most Visual Studio commands support keyboard shortcuts and have a default shortcut assigned. Plugins may introduce their own shortcuts and the best thing is that you can assign or reassign your own shortcut to any Visual Studio command that supports them. You can see on the slide settings for keyboard shortcuts here and to access shortcut settings you need to open environment section and visual studio options and find keyboard subsection. Now I want to mention some useful shortcuts and give you a quick demo of how you can assign and use them. So first com command is duplicate. It is visual studio command that duplicates currently selected line or text. It can be found in the top level edit menu. You can see it on the slide. You can assign a shortcut to it in a shortcut settings by looking for edit duplicate command. It is a command identifier that can be used to find command in shortcut settings and a few other places. Note that by convention Visual Studio command identifiers consist of several parts separated by dot. Each part except the last one usually is the name of the menu or submenu you need to open to access the command and the last part is the name of the command itself. So now let's take a closer look. So first let's assign a shortcut. I need to open environment, then keyboard section and now uh, I uh, will search for the command. I type duplicate and select the command. 
uh, you can see that there are already shortcuts assigned for this command. Now I want um, to pick the scope. I use global scope, but you can uh, restrict uh, the shortcut uh, to some particular Visual Studio window, but I want to make, to make it applicable everywhere. And then I uh, type it in this text box. Control plus D, then Control plus D again. I use this combination because uh, for me D stands for duplicate and it's easier for me to remember. I can see that uh, it is already assigned to this command. Now I assign, press OK. And now let's see how I can use it. I frequently rely on it when I need to create a lot of similar code. For example, I can duplicate the set enabled line used for um, deck fields user interface configuration. So I just press caret on a the line, then press shortcut. And then I just need to change the BKL field to the one I need. I can also use it in a big BKL statement. So I can just duplicate one line in a properly formatted BKL query and then change some parts. Here, I will duplicate one of conditions and then just change BKL field. So I duplicate the condition, add one angle brace, and then I just select the BKL field I need. If you select some text and use this command, you will get a duplicate of selected text instead of a line. This can be are useful sometimes when you work with the XML or JSON files, you can duplicate whole sections and then just change small parts that you need. Another useful shortcut allows you to quickly indent the selected text or line. You probably already use tab key to add indentation for the currently selected line, but it works for the selected text too. So press tab and if you hold shift and then press tab, you will decrease the indentation. I find it useful when I need to fix formatting or copy paste some code snippet and I need to remove excessive indentation. Quite often I find it useful to show IntelliSense for code completion suggestions at the current position to do it manually. So just play the current and then press Ctrl plus space. And you can see the list of all deck fields. You can also move current line or selection up and down one line at a time with um, uh, so see how you can move something up with Alt plus up arrow like this and with Alt plus down arrow. There are many shortcuts related to text selection. I don't use many of them, but I do use Control plus A to select the whole text in the file. There are many other usages for shortcuts. For instance, the next feature multiple carrots is entirely based on keyboard shortcuts. Multiple carrots feature allows you to edit multiple places of your code by creating multiple carrots and applying changes to all of them simultaneously. The feature is used when you have some text that appears at several places in the document and you want to apply same changes to some of these places or to all of them. When you use multiple carrots, Visual Studio will find occurrences of the same text and create extra carrots for them. It can create carrots for all occurrences or only for some of them. You can use multiple carrots from the user interface. The commands can be found in the top level edit menu in the multiple, multiple carrots section. But it will be faster and more convenient to use keyboard shortcuts. There are several commands, but I usually use only two of them. The first one is insert carrots at all matching with shift plus alt plus semicolon. It will create carrots at all occurrences of the selected text in the document. And the second one is insert next matching carrot, shift plus alt plus dot. This is the command I use quite often when I edit text with similar structure. Now let's look at Visual Studio to see how you can use this feature. So I decided to demonstrate the usefulness of this feature on a real life scenario. So here I have unit test project from the Accuminator solution. These are tests for diagnostic that uh, checks deck and deck field names and reports error if they are not allowed by Accumatica framework rules. For example, you can't have a company ID as a name of your deck field because it is a reserved name. Now, as I can see, all these tests uh, start with prefix test. 
which looks uh, unnecessary to me. You can deduce that these are tests just from the context. The code is inside test project and the class also has the word test in its name. So I wish to remove this prefix. It just makes uh, test names longer, but there are six such methods and I don't want to change each one of them separately. Multiple carrots feature allows us to remove the test prefix for all six methods at once. Let's remove the test word only in methods by selecting the test word in the first method. method. And now let's add carrots to next method by pressing shift plus alt plus dot. So I pre each time I press it, Visual Studio adds a new carrot to the next matching occurrences. And I pressed it six times, and now I will delete word test in six locations by pressing backspace. You can also use multiple carrots to quickly change APIs. Our new unit tests are asynchronous and return task instead of void. Let's quickly elaborate these old tests. We just need to add multiple carrots to all void words. So select void word, and then press shift plus alt plus semicolon and replace void with task. I got compile um, errors everywhere because methods used in tests return void instead of task. So let's quickly fix the errors by using an async version of these methods. We have to fix the error manually for the first test since it doesn't use verify C sharp fix method. Just select this method and press uh, control plus space to call code completion suggestions and then select uh, uh, the async version of the method. And now let's fix uh, the rest of the errors. So select verify C sharp fix and then press shift plus alt plus semicolon to add carrots to all occurrences of the verify C sharp fix method. Then press right arrow to remove the selection and just type the async suffix in five locations. All done. The next feature is code snippets. Code snippets are small fragments of reusable code that can be inserted into your document by using IntelliSense suggestion, a command from context menu, or a keyboard shortcut. They typically contain commonly used code blocks such as try finally or if else blocks, but they can be used to insert entire classes or methods. Snippets can contain placeholders with different names that you must replace to fit the precise code you are writing. The replacement you make is repeated for every instance of the placeholder with the same name in the snippet. You can move to the next placeholder by pressing tab key. Let me show you a snippet for the reversed for loop. So I type for and select a shortcut for with double R at the end of the list um, in the list of intelligence suggestions. And then I press tab to expand the snippet. And as you can see, this snippet has two placeholders, uh, loop variable I and uh, length. And if you hover your mouse over the placeholder, you can see the tooltip actually. Uh, so when I replace the loop counter I uh, with J and then press tab to move to the next placeholder, you can see that all occurrences of I in the snippet are changed to J. Uh, then let me replace uh, the second placeholder with list count. And then I press enter to exit snippet editing mode this will place my cursor inside the loop, inside the, into the location specified by the snippet. There are actually two types of snippets. I have shown you a so-called expansion snippet that can be inserted at the cursor position. There are also surround with snippets that you can use to surround the selected text. For example, we can um, use surround with snippet for the reversed for loop to put selected code inside the reversed loop like this, open context menu, here is snippet section, uh, surround with command, and uh, select visual C sharp snippets, find snippet for the reverse for loop, and here you go. There are also uh, similar snippets for other uh, control flow statements like if, while, for each, and etc. 
there are snippets to quickly generate empty declaration for a type or type member. For example, I frequently use code snippets uh, to generate default instance constructor for graphs. To do this, I type I type ct or snippet shortcut and then press tab. Some code snippets also can use more advanced features. For instance, I use code snippet for switch statement to quickly generate switch statement with all different cases. Uh, here I can add switch for text type local variable, which holds a num value. So I type switch and select uh, snippet shortcut for switch, press tab to expand, and then replace placeholder with text type, or you can see in telecode suggestion. And then I just move the cursor, and you can see cases for all enum values generated by Visual Studio. Snippets can also add missing using directives and references to assemblies from Global Assembly Cache. And now I will demonstrate how you can manage snippets in your Visual Studio and add new snippets to it. Visual Studio comes with a lot of code snippets for different programming languages and frameworks. You can also write your own code snippets and import them in Visual Studio. They are, in fact, simple XML files with a snippet extension. You can uh, share them with your teammates. Snippets are managed in the Code Snippets Manager window. It can be accessed from the top-level tools menu. Find Code Snippets Manager command there. In Code Snippets Manager, you select the programming language and see all code snippets registered for it. You see a list of folders that contain code snippets and are registered in Visual Studio. Add and remove buttons here allow you to add a new registered folder for code snippets or remove an existing folder from the list. It is recommended to organize code snippets with folders. For any registered folder, Visual Studio will correctly display its subfolders. Import button allows you to import code snippet files. And now let's see how you can use code snippets to simplify your work with Akimetica Framework. To simplify the development with Akimetica Framework, we developed Akimetica Code Snippets. It is a collection of code snippets that includes templates for DAC, DAC fields, and graph events. We created a separate GitHub repository called Code Snippets in Akimetica organization. You can see a reference to it here. You can download Akimetica snippets from it and manually import them into Visual Studio. The next version of Accuminator will include them as well. Now let's see what they look like. So let's start with snippets for deck. I can type shortcut deck and IntelliSense will suggest me snippets for deck and deck fields. So let's try the snippet for deck first, press tab. Notice that the template creates deck with PX cache name attribute on it. There should be a localizable string constant passed to the attributes um, constructor to correctly localize deck name. Usually in Akimetica, classes containing such string constants are called messages. And let's name this deck invoice. I already created invoice uh, constant in the messages class in advance. And now press enter. And let's add uh, a boolean field called selected to this deck. I will do it with deck field bool shortcut, press tab, and uh, let's name it selected. Unfortunately, Visual Studio code snippets do not support transformation between Pascal case and camel case, so you need to type uh, the name of the BQL field manually. And the last uh, placeholder is db. It allows you to quickly transform your uh, db bound field created by default to unbound by removing it. And now press enter. Let's add another um, uh, field, a string field called description. I will do it with this placeholder uh, snippet shortcut. And let's name it description. Let's type dql field name. And then I will keep it DB bound and then just type its length. Now let's add some uh, graph events. So for generic events, uh, there is a naming convention 
uh, to use underscore as event name. So all snippet shortcuts for graph events also start with underscore to make it simpler to discover them. So let's add field defaulting event and press tab and you will receive a, a dialog with three field defaulting templates. All of them have different signatures. First one will create a template with generic full signature. This means that there will be two type parameters, both for deck and deck field. Let's replace the deck with text ram and use IntelliSense to pick the field. Let's take a look at other signatures. So second template uh, generic short signature contains only one type parameter representing BQL deck BQL field. And the last one, a name convention signature generates classic non-generic event uh, that uses naming convention. So that's all four code snippets. And the last uh, thing I want to show you in this section is C Sharp interactive window that you can use to quickly run a piece of code. It is similar to interactive editors that exist for other languages such as Python. I use this window to quickly test some .NET framework API or see the result of some algorithm. So let's do a quick demo. Uh, C Sharp interactive is located in the view top level menu in other windows section uh, here. Uh, you can just type some C-sharp code and see the result. For example, I forgot how enumerable range method works. Let's refresh my memory by typing enumerable range from 1 to 10 and press enter. And you can see the result. Notice that this is a completely separate coding session. It shares nothing with code editor's main window and doesn't have access to any debug information. I can clear the window or restart uh, the entire session. I can also try different stuff here to understand the runtime better. Even unsafe code is allowed here. For example, people usually think that all types in .NET framework are derived from their object type. Let's check this statement with a pointer type. So here I type type of pointer to in. Then let's look at its base type. Press enter. And it's now. So it doesn't have a base type actually. That's all with editor features. And now let's move to the code analysis functionality. I will start with a brief overview. Modern versions of Visual Studio use diagnostics written with Roslyn framework for the code analysis of C Sharp and Visual Basic code. Visual Studio provides a special support for such diagnostics. And the most important feature is the extensibility of the code analysis that allows developers to run custom Roslyn diagnostics. This is very useful for framework developers. They can write framework specific code checks that will make sure that their product is used correctly. For example, there are diagnostics for XUnit test framework. For Acumetica, there is Accuminator, and there are even diagnostics for the correct usage of Roslyn itself. There are also advanced general purpose diagnostics for C Sharp and Visual Basic developed by community as open source projects. The code analysis system is very flexible, and there are many ways for you to configure analysis and suppress alerts. There are also two ways to add custom diagnostics to your solution. You can install them as a Visual Studio extension if you want to use code analysis only for yourself. And you can add a NuGet package with diagnostics to the project to enforce rules for everyone in the team. Now let's take a look on code analysis settings. Each language has its own code analysis settings located in Visual Studio options in the text editor section. C-sharp settings can be found in the C-sharp advanced subsection. The first group of settings is named analysis. And now let's take a look at them. So here in Visual Studio options, in the text editor section, C-sharp advanced. Uh, there is quite a lot of options to play with. Some of them are very technical. So I would like to cover only the most useful ones. Some settings here can significantly affect the performance of your Visual Studio. The first setting affecting the performance is the code analysis scope here. 
Do you want to disable the analysis completely, analyze only the current document, all open documents, or the entire solution? The first option will be the most performant, and the last option is obviously bad for performance. And I usually use the third one, open documents, as a compromise. All found errors will be listed in the error list to window here. The second setting affecting performance of Visual Studio is run code analysis in a separate process here. I need to provide some context to better describe uh, this option and what to do with it. <coughs> For a long time, Visual Studio remained 32-bit application with memory limited only to 4 gigabytes. It quickly reached this limit, but instead of switching to a 64-bit version, Visual Studio developers took another path. They got around the memory restriction by creating separate processes and executing some of Visual Studio workload in them. Visual Studio 2019 is performing code analysis in a separate process. This enhanced Visual Studio performance and UI responsiveness. If you use Visual Studio 2019, then I suggest to look for a switch, use 64-bit process for code analysis, and turn it on. The analysis settings are located in the same place. However, there are some downsides. There is a lot of inter-process communication between the main Visual Studio process and the process doing analysis, which adds extra overhead for data serialization. And although in general my Visual Studio was stable, there were rare occasions when the inter-process communication broke, effectively disabling all code analysis features and forcing me to restart Visual Studio. Finally, a 64-bit version of Visual Studio was released. It is Visual Studio 2022. It can use much more memory in a single process. So, in my opinion, there is no longer a reason to run code analysis in a separate process and carry all related expenses. I believe that you can disable run code analysis in a separate process switch, and if you observe a decrease in performance, you can always turn it on again. Another interesting setting is uh, enable navigation to decompile sources here. Uh, uh, it enables Visual Studio built-in decompiler. Let's take a closer look. So when the switch is disabled, when I try to navigate to definition of a type from some reference assembly, for example, PX graph, I receive a brief overview of generated uh, overview generated from assembly metadata. So I can see a list of members, but I can see any code here. Uh, and, but uh, when this feature is turned on, let me enable the switch. When I navigate to PX graph definition, I can. I receive uh, the decompiled code, so I can actually see the code here. And uh, there is no longer um, a reason to switch to an external decompiler, so this can be very convenient. Finally, there is a new experimental feature, display diagnostics inline in Visual Studio 2022. So uh, uh, if it is enabled, if the line of code contains only one error, Visual Studio will display the error directly in code. So here you can see it. You no longer need to hover the mouse over the error or open error list uh, uh, to window to see the error message. And there are two modes that allow you to choose where exactly you want to see the inline error immediately after the code or on the right edge of the editor. We discussed global code analysis settings, but there are also many project-specific settings. You can override them for a particular .NET project. Some of them can be accessed from the project properties window. You can see it on the slide. This is properties window for .NET framework projects, and the code analysis section here actually refers to the legacy code analysis technology, also known as FXCOPE static code analysis. It is currently obsolete, and this section is not used anymore. Interesting settings are stored inside the build section. You can select a warning level uh, for the project. A higher level means more warnings. Uh, level 0 turns off emission of all warnings. Level 1 displays only severe warnings. Each level adds some uh, less severe warnings. And level 4 displays all warnings present in C Sharp 8. This is the default warning level. The compiler accepts values greater than 4 to enable so-called warning waves. 
These are new warn warnings introduced by new versions of C-sharp compiler. They are disabled by default to avoid breaking changes in existing solutions, and to enable them, you need to set warning level setting directly in the project file to the number of a corresponding wave. So wave 5 adds warnings from C-sharp 9, wave 6 adds warnings from C-sharp 10, and wave 7 adds warnings from C-sharp 11. You can suppress specific warnings, and you can choose to treat all your warnings as errors. This can be done to enforce code conventions in the project. You can also treat as errors only specific warnings. There are many more code analysis settings that you can specify directly in the project file. I won't cover them in this session, but you can easily find them in Microsoft documentation. Now I will show you how to run code analysis manually on a project or solution. So we need to open Analyze top level menu and select Run Code Analysis submenu. There are two commands here that allow you to run code analysis on the entire solution or only on the current project. And all found errors will be listed in the error list window. You can use this feature to find all errors in the solution or project. For example, you can find all accumulator alerts. Now let's move to the next section, which describes Visual Studio integration with external tools. There are, there are many ways to integrate Visual Studio with external tools. First of all, there are built-in integrations. Some examples include integration with Git and other version control systems. There, are, there is also advanced integration with uh, SQL Server. You can look at the SQL Server Object Explorer window, which is available from the top level view menu. There is an advanced support for Unity and other game engines. You can install them with Visual Studio installer. Visual Studio works with popular unit test frameworks like XUnit. You can check out the test explorer window available from the top level test menu. And another way to inter integrate is to add tool to Visual Studio list of external tools. You can access this list by opening top level tools menu and finding external tools commands. Let's take a closer look. So here in the tools menu, find external tools command, and you can see uh, external tools editor on the screen. The list contains all external tools added to Visual Studio. You need to press add button to add a new tool. Then you need to enter a name for it. I want to add the pixie tool to this list. Pixie is a free color picker that will display the color of the pixel under the mouse pointer. So let me type Pixie, and in the uh, command field, you need to select the executable file of the external tool. So let me find it. Um, you can um, specify command line arguments, and Visual Studio actually can provide arguments from the current context. For instance, you can uh, pass current carrot uh, position, current line and current column from the carrot position, or currently selected text. You can also specify working directory for the external tool. For example, you can use uh, the project directory or solution directory. And after you save uh, your changes, uh, the edit tool will appear in the tools menu in the same section as the external tools command. So here. And it actually opened the pixie tool for me. You can also specify an external tool as a designer for files with specific extension. Let's see how you can do this. Visual Studio allows you to choose which tool should be used to open files with specific extension. You can pick a different editor or specify a custom tool as an editor. Now we will use this functionality to set Acumatica report designer as a default editor for Acumatica RPX report. Again, let's take a closer look. So here you can see that I have uh, several uh, RPX reports and you can access the editor selection dialog from the context menu with open with command. There are many available editors shipped with Visual Studio that can be used to open the file. By default, Visual Studio opens reports in the XML editor and external tools like Acumatica Report Designer can be added to this list with the add button. After you press it, the add program dialog will appear. 
you need to specify path to the external tool. Uh, so let me find it on my machine. So here I pass, uh, I select uh, the um, executable file for the report designer. I can also specify user-friendly name for it. And optionally, I can pass command line arguments. Uh, custom tools that you have added yourself can be removed from the list with the remove button. And I can set report designer as the default editor for reports with set as default. And then I press OK. So it will open the file in the report designer here. And if I try to open another file, it also is opened in the report designer. So now let's look at Visual Studio Git integration. Today, version control systems are a crucial part of the modern collaborative software development. Currently, Git is the most popular tool among them. A lot of projects built with all kinds of technology rely on Git. This is true for Kumetic as well. I won't cover Git here. It is too big for this session. So I assume that most of you have used Git before. Git is a console application, but there are many UI clients that display information about repository in a convenient way. For example, Git extensions or source tree. Visual Studio Git integration is also UI client for Git. It can show you a list of local and remote branches in the repository, staged and unstaged changes, repository settings, branch history, and many other things. You can also perform standard actions like pull, push, merge, create new branches, and stash changes. I find it convenient because I don't need to switch from Visual Studio to some other tool to do Git-related stuff. It is also very convenient to see file comparison directly in Visual Studio. So let's take a closer look. Now, there are two primary windows for Git integration, Git changes and Git repository. Both are available from the top level Git menu and from the view menu as well. Let's start with Git changes. It lists um, all changes, all changed files in the repository that are tracked by Git. You can see what is changed by double clicking on the file. And a file div with unchanged version will open. And if you open a context menu on some changed file, you will see a list of available actions. And uh, among them, undo changes is very useful because it will revert all uncommitted changes done to the file. You can use it for a folder too. You can stage some of the changed files in order to commit only part of your changes. Or you can commit all changes. You can, uh, you can also unstage them and you, can, uh, and you can commit all changes with commit all and you don't need to stage anything in this case. And there is a text box where you can write the commit message. There is also a amend checkbox. If enabled, it will amend the last commit. This means that instead of creating a new separate commit, you will modify the last one you created. It can be used to add some minor changes or to fix uh, the commit message. And uh, note the little triangle on the right side of the commit button. It opens a drop-down menu with some extra commands. In my opinion, the most useful among them is stash, which will create a new git stash. And below the list of changes, there is a list of stashes. Uh, you can uh, pick one and uh, apply it, uh, or you can delete it. And you can see its contents with a uh, double click, like this. On the top of the, of the window, there is a branch selector that you can use to change the current branch. To the right, there is a toolbar with common Git actions like fetch, pull, push, sync. And uh, the button with three dots open a menu with more commands. For me, the most useful is open in command prompt, which will open uh, Windows command line in the repository folder. Here it is. Like other Git UI clients, Visual Studio exposes only a subset of Git capabilities. So I frequently use open in, com in, command, uh, open in command prompt to quickly open console and run advanced Git commands there. I also use it to quickly run automatic build scripts. The second window, Git repository, here, consists of two parts. The left part displays all branches in the repository. You can see the current branch here. Its name is highlighted in bold. 
and the right part displays the history of the selected branch. Let's look at the, length, at the left side first. You can filter branches here with a filter text box. You can switch to another branch by double clicking on it. The context menu contains a list of available actions. You can check out branch, rename branch or delete it. You can pull changes for a branch or push them to the remote repository. You can open a separate document tab uh, with branch history and you can compare two branches inside Visual Studio and you can create a new local branch from existing one. I find this very useful because in Acumatica exit branch names must follow strict naming conventions and they can be long. I can do less typing by selecting an existing branch, pressing Ctrl plus C to copy its name and then pasting it in this dialog. And then I just need to slightly edit the name to fit my needs. And the right side of the window displays branch history. As I mentioned, you can open it in a separate tab. The history is displayed in a grid with columns that contain commit message, commit author, date and commit ID. There is a filter and text box in the top right corner that can be used to filter commits. For example, you can search commits from a particular person. There are some switches to configure the appearance of the grids, but I won't go into details here. And there are many useful actions available in the context menu. First of all, you can see commit details. And this also can be done with a double click on commit. So like this and uh, commit details will display all changed files included in commit and the comparison window for each file. It is very useful for investigation of code history. You can open it in a separate tab and see all changes done in commit. You can also check out, uh, revert and cherry pick commit. You can reset all changes made after commit. This is equivalent to git reset command. You can choose how to do reset. You can keep all changes as uncommitted or delete them. You can add a new tag to commit and there are commands to do some other things, but I usually use commands that I just listed. As I mentioned, Visual Studio allows you to configure Git settings. They are located in Visual Studio options in the source control section. There are two sets of settings, global settings that are used for all repositories and local settings that can override global settings. These settings are standard for Git, so I won't cover them. And that's all with Visual Studio. Now let's talk about other developer tools that are related to Visual Studio. As you can see, Visual Studio comes with a huge number of different features. It can cover most of developer needs, but it comes with a price. Each feature is a little of your machine's performance. Quite often, I just need to quickly edit some configuration file. For example, XML or JSON file. There is no need for a full-fledged code editor with code analysis and other advanced features. But I still want to use features like syntax highlighting, advanced search and code folding. To do this, I use lightweight alternatives to Visual Studio. Here are two of them. First one is Visual Studio Code. It is a popular code editor. It is fast, starts quickly and has integration with Git. There are also numerous plugins for it. The second is Notepad++. Notepad++. It is another lightweight code editor that has even less features than Visual Studio Code. However, it provides features like search, syntax highlighting and code folding. I would like to briefly mention the tools developed by JetBrains. For .NET developers, they created several tools that can serve as alternative to Visual Studio. So uh, first there is Rider, a code editor designed for .NET development. Rider has all resharper features, good performance and user experience. It also has a compelling price. Next tools are performance profiler.trace and memory profiler.memory. Visual Studio comes with its own built-in profilers, but these two profilers can be more convenient to you and provide extra functionality. And finally, there is a free standalone.pick decompiler that can decompile .NET DLLs to the equivalent C Sharp code. It has advanced features like showing in immediate intermediate language generated for code and displaying compiler generated code. At the final part of this session, I would like to mention some useful Visual Studio extensions. Of course, I would like to recommend to you Accuminate extension. 
I already mentioned it a lot. If you write code based on a Qmatica framework, then you definitely should use it. But now I want to list some other useful plugins. I will start with two big extensions. Both are not free, but have available trail versions. First is ReSharpen from JetBrains. I think many developers here are already using it. It is a huge extension that performs advanced code analysis and adds many useful features to Visual Studio. I won't go into details here because ReSharper is too big to cover it in this session. Second is OSCode plugin that greatly extends Visual Studio debugging experience. Again, it is too big to cover its features here, but you should definitely check out its page on Visual Studio Marketplace to see what amazing things they are doing. There are many code analysis extensions for Visual Studio. Some are paid, but many are free. For example, Roslinator is a free open source extension that provides more than 500 diagnostics, refactorings, and code fixes. Another well-known extension is StyleCop. It performs code analysis to enforce code style rules for your source code. There are also plugins that provide security code analysis looking for vulnerabilities in your code. By the way, you should look for code analysis extensions not only in Visual Studio Marketplace, but also in the NuGet Packages Gallery. Many code analysis extensions are available only as NuGet Packages. For instance, to use the latest version of StyleCoop analysis I just mentioned, you should install StyleCoop Analyzer's NuGet package. Next is a popular free spell checker plugin called Visual Studio Spell Checker, and there are multiple free and paid spell checking extensions in the Visual Studio Marketplace. There are several plugins for Visual Studio that give you an easy way of attaching to specific processes. This is particularly useful for debugging web server worker processes. Such extensions allow you to attach or reattach to a process with a single mouse click. I use Debug Attach Manager extension, but there is also a popular reattach extension. There are also extensions like ys 4 and Cadenian that allow you to color much more code elements than Visual Studio allows by default. There are plugins for Visual Studio that provide nice small features to enhance your productivity. Some extensions open the selected document in some other tool. I frequently use two such extensions. Open, uh, uh, which one opens selected document in Visual Studio Code and the other in Notepad++. The much margin extension adds purple dot indicators to the scroll bar and highlights text in the code editor for matches of the selected word under the carrot. So let me quickly demonstrate it. Here I have text trend word and you can see on, in my scroll bar purple dot indicators. So they are representing uh, matching all text trend words in my document. And another extension code alignment aligns your code vertically to improve readability. For example, it can make multiple assign statements more readable by placing all equals sign signs at the same column, like this. I write a lot of XML doc comments to document the code I wrote. It can be rather boring. Fortunately, there is a Taminia Pro documentation plugin that can generate a clever comment template for me. It uses the name of the code member as a foundation, so I can generate uh, the clever template, it, uh, almost, uh, it requires almost no edits from me. And here is another example. Ataminir is not free, but there is an alternative ghost doc extension that has a free community version. And this is by no means a complete list. If you explore Visual Studio Marketplace, you may find other very interesting extensions. As you can see, even with free plugins, it is possible to greatly enhance and customize your Visual Studio. So in this session, we consider tools that can help you with your day-to-day -day work, boost your productivity, ensure product quality, and take care of our routine tasks. We started with Accuminator and discussed what's new in the latest release. Then we switched to Visual Studio and looked at its uh, different parts. We discussed how to use Visual Studio features to write code more efficiently. And then we dug into settings to enable some advanced features and optimize Visual Studio performance. After that, we investigated how Visual Studio integrates with Git and other tools. And at the end, we discussed other tools, alternatives to Visual Studio and useful Visual Studio extensions. 
Still, this was only a small subset of Visual, of Visual Studio features. We haven't touched debugging, performance profiling. There are many settings not covered by this session. Like I said in the beginning, Visual Studio is huge. You should be curious and investigate your code editor. It can surprise you with a lot of things you didn't expect. Knowing all its capabilities can significantly change the way you work. So here you can find links to the information about Accuminator. And here is a collection of links about Visual Studio. Thank you for listening to my presentation and I will be waiting for your questions in the questions and the answers chat.